Once again, it is a privilege to share God's word with you this morning, um, and I pray that God's word moves within all of us this morning for His glory. If you'd like to open your Bibles with me, um, the passage of Scripture we're going to be focus- focusing on today is from the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, uh, and it's entitled, Jesus Heals a Paralytic. If you don't have a Bible, um, that's, that's okay, don't worry, um, just please raise your hand and one of our service team um, will give you one. Um, if you don't own a Bible, if you don't have one at home, you're welcome to keep that Bible, but as Jason always says, as long as you read it. The passage will also be on screen, um, so please follow with me as we read. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, that's Jesus, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic man, carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And, and, when, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? Is he blaspheming? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Now this passage of scripture isn't just about a crippled man being healed by Jesus and of Jesus performing a miracle of healing. No, this is a story about overcoming obstacles. Obstacles that keep us from Jesus, that keep us from living lives that glorify Him, and from entering into a relationship with Him. Through this text this morning, we will see how various obstacles were overcome by various individuals in order to have an encounter with Jesus, and to reach a better understanding of who Jesus is, so that we can overcome the many obstacles that we face in our own lives. We will do this by focusing on three main things. And for those that are taking notes, these are going to be the three main points of the message. First off, obstacles come in many shapes and sizes. Secondly, we need to understand perspective. And finally, don't freak out. It's going to be okay. So let's jump right in. Point number one, obstacles come in many shapes and sizes. These obstacles also affect different parts of our lives and at different stages of our lives and times of our lives. Some of us face physical obstacles in our lives that keep us from living for God and keep us from being an active part of His church. These could be things like failing health or physical disability. could even be our careers or our line of work that may require us to work on Sundays or even seven days a week. The coronavirus is a big physical, physical obstacle we face these days. Some of us might be struggling with some emotional obstacles a disagreement with another member of the church, anxieties of many forms that, de- that debilitate us and make us want to recluse and stay in our homes out of fear, our doubts both in society, ourselves and other people, and maybe even in God. Phobias and fears can also keep us from living our lives fully for Jesus. The list goes on. The point is, we are all facing some sort of obstacle that is trying to wedge between us and Jesus. That's trying to prevent us from reaching our full potential and living our lives completely and wholly for Him. In the passage we just read, it gives the account of a crippled man or a paralytic who is trying to get to Jesus, but struggled to because he cannot walk. This was made even more challenging with the fact that there was a crowd gathered around Jesus, which was blocking his path. The obstacles facing the man in his attempt to reach Jesus were numerous and seemed overwhelming. 
You would think that throughout the passage of Scripture, it was only the, the crippled man who faced obstacles, right? But there are, in fact, three groups of people that were facing obstacles in this narrative, each of them very different in shape and form, but all achieving the same goal, preventing them from having an encounter with Jesus Christ. We have already mentioned the obvious one, and that is the crippled man. Now, we aren't told if he was crippled from the waist down or the neck down or one side of his body. And it would have been almost impossible for him to reach Jesus on his own. We must remember that back in those days, there were no wheelchairs or formal sets of crutches. At best, he would have had access to a walking stick if he was partially crippled. But the fact that he had to be carried suggests that he was totally crippled and couldn't walk with any form of aid. The second group who encountered obstacles on that day were the four men who were carrying the crippled man. These men would have most likely been close family or friends or a mixture of both. They too wanted to reach Jesus, but not for themselves, but so that their friend could hopefully receive healing and be able to walk again. Now it would have been really relevantly easy for them individually to make their way through the crowd, to just push people out the way and get within earshot to listen to what Jesus was preaching. But not only did they have to get themselves to Jesus, but they had to get their friend who was crippled, not only with an inshot, not only with an earshot, sorry but to physically be in Jesus' presence. This was made even more difficult when they had to come up with a creative way to get him inside the house because they couldn't get through the, the crowds. And when they came up with the idea to make a hole in the roof and lower their friend down, you can imagine it would have been almost impossible. The one good thing out of all this is that houses back in those days were usually small and simple so they were not built very high off the ground. So there was some silver lining in the face of the obstacles. The third and final group that were facing obstacles on that day were the scribes, which we read about in verses 6 and 7. I'll reread that again. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now you could be wondering what obstacles they would have been facing. They were sitting in the house with Jesus, writing down what he was teaching. They were in prime position to encounter him. Yet it was their simple unbelief in who Jesus is that was the obstacle preventing them from encountering him. So you can see there are things that are obstacles for some, but not for others. Just like getting inside the house wasn't an obstacle for the scribes, it was for the crippled man and his friends. And having faith and belief of Je in Jesus was what drove the crippled man and his friends to getting to him. Their lack of faith prevented the scribes from encountering Jesus as the Son of God after hearing Jesus forgive the crippled man of his sins. To give you an example, I have two major phobias in my life. One of them is fairly common, and uh, if, if you recognize the, the picture on the screen, You'll know that if you've ever been to the military or to a, a, ch a church or a, a school camp that has an obstacle course, you would have been faced with the dreaded climbing wall. Now, most people wouldn't see this as a, an obstacle or a phobia, just merely a test of how well you can climb. But if you have a, a, a phobia of heights like I do, that climbing wall might as well be Mount Everest. The other major phobia I have is one of needles. I'm not afraid to admit that when I go to the doctor for my annual checkup or to have blood drawn, I drag my wife along Justine to come with me and hold my hand so I can get through it. Um, because she, she'll attest that whenever a needle comes near my skin, I start freaking out. Um, but I'm very grateful that she does come with me. Um, otherwise, I don't think I'd ever go to the doctor. And some of you might be chuckling to yourselves. You might find these things very easy to do. And that's okay, but I don't. And I'm sure there are things that you struggle with that I might find easy. We all have our own obstacles in their various shapes and sizes. Moving on to point number two, perspective is important. Now, why is perspective important? Why does it even matter when we deal with obstacles in our own lives? It's important because we need perspective so we can better understand each other's obstacles. So we can sympathize and empathize with one another when we're going through a rough time. 
Imagine you're the crippled man from the passage. You're lying on your mat at the edge of the crowd. You know somewhere in that mass of people there's a man, or there's a house, sorry, and in that house is a man named Jesus. And that man, Jesus, could heal you and give you the ability to walk again. But all, all you can do is see feet in front of you. Seems pretty hopeless, doesn't it? Your chances of making it through the masses of people, even if you could crawl on the ground, are slim. You don't know what direction to go. You don't know exactly where the house is, where Jesus is in. And the only immediate thought you have is hoping that no one stands on you as you try to crawl through the mass of feet. The situation seems pretty hopeless indeed. Now picture you're the four friends. It would be simple enough for you to just walk through the crowd and make your way to the house, which you can glimpse over the heads of everyone to get to Jesus. Pretty simple apart for the, from the fact that you are carrying your crippled friend along with you and have to find a creative way to get into that house. Once you've managed to come up with a plan to make a hole in the roof and lower your friend down, it's not so simple anymore. The task is a lot harder now, but it's still doable, especially because you believe that this man, Jesus, will be able to heal your crippled friend, so you have motivation to persevere. Now put yourselves in the shoes of the scribes. You don't have anything to worry about, right? You're in the house, sitting at the feet of Jesus, taking a detailed account of his teaching. It doesn't get much better than this. You're in the front row. But when Jesus said to the, says to a crippled man who has just been descended from a hole in the roof like a scene from a movie, that his sins have been forgiven because of his faith in who Jesus is, you straight away doubt and sit in disbelief and question the authenticity of Jesus and who he says he is. Same goal, encountering Jesus, but very different situations and very different obstacles. It reminds me of the elephant analogy. So four people were sent into a very dark room, and there was a, they were told there's a single object in this room. Their goal was to figure out what the, the object was with only using their sense of touch. So the four men are led into the room, um, the, the lights are off, it's completely pitch dark. They can't see anything. They each are situated around the object and are given a couple of minutes to try and deduce what the object is just by feeling and touching the object. After a few minutes, each member of the group is asked what they think the object is. The first member says, no, they, they think it's a wall. You know, it's pretty solid, pretty sturdy, it doesn't move. Um, when they touch it, they, they're quite sure it's the wall. The second person says, no, it feels more like a tree trunk. It's round and it's sturdy. They move on to the, the third person. He says, no, this feels more like a piece of thick pipe. And finally, the, the fourth person says, no, no, it's none of those. It's a piece of rope of some sort. Baffled that they all are coming up with different answers to the same object, they start arguing and are, are quite certain that they've been tricked, that there isn't one object but four separate objects that each of them has been given. Suddenly, the lights come on and they're surrounded, they're standing around a giant elephant. Each person was feeling a different body part of the same ele elephant, resulting in their different answers. The first man was standing at the elephant's side, the second was at one of its feet, the third was holding its trunk, and the fourth was holding its tail. Do you see the value and importance of perspective? Each person was certain their guesses were right and thought they had been tricked instead of hearing all the answers and thinking about the other members of the group's perspective on the object. How often do we do that in our own lives, church? We close our minds to other people's points of view and think our views are the only correct ones. When we see someone struggling with something we find easy to overcome, we often say things like, it's not a big deal, just get over it, it's not that bad. You're just overreacting. We even go so far at times as to mock and ridicule others that are struggling with things we find easy. An extroverted person struggles to understand why an introvert finds social gatherings exhausting. Likewise, the introvert is confused when the extrovert says lockdown was tough and they almost went insane being alone for so long. 
You can imagine the three groups in the passage would have had similar feelings towards each other's situations with regards to getting to Jesus. The scribes wouldn't have understood the unsurmountable task the crippled man faced and how he was going to reach Jesus. Just as the crippled man wouldn't have understood how the scribes could ever doubt who Jesus was because he believed in who Jesus was. Our obstacles come in many shapes and sizes, and seeing things from other perspectives is very important. Now, there's one substantial ob obstacle I haven't mentioned this morning. This obstacle is something that we all have to deal with. It doesn't matter what country we come from, it doesn't matter how rich or poor we are, what jobs we have, or how big our houses are, it affects us all the same. I'm sure you can guess it, but that obstacle is sin. Point number three, don't freak out. It's going to be okay. Sin is the great equalizer. It is something we all need to deal with on a daily basis. We all sin. There's no doubting that. Only one person to ever walk this earth did not sin, and that is Jesus. Our sins prevent us from living our lives fully for Jesus and can hinder us from achieving what God has called for us to do. More so, the guilt we can feel from our sins is equally as debilitating as it can lead down the path of self-doubt and the feeling of worthlessness. We start saying things like, I sin so much, or I've sinned so much, how could I ever sit in church and call myself a follower of Christ? Or I've done too many bad things in my life. I've committed so many sins, how could anyone ever forgive me of them? It's very easy to fall into that trap of that kind of thinking. Some of you might even be in that place today. But I'll urge all of you and all of us, don't freak out, it's going to be okay. And here's why. So sin is only mentioned once in the passage we read from Mark. But let's take a look at how Jesus deals with it. Let's go ahead and read the second half of the, of the passage again, starting from verse 6. It says, Now some of the scribes were sitting down, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic or the crippled man? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. After forgiving the crippled man of his sins, the scribes doubted who Jesus was. Jesus' response was the ultimate, I'll show you moment. He says, which is easier to say to the man, your sins are forgiven or stand up, take your mat and walk? Now clearly it's easier to say to someone, your sins are forgiven, because you can't actually see or tell that their sins have in fact been forgiven. So what does Jesus do? He demonstrates to the scribes that he is in fact who he says he is, and tells the crippled man to walk, which he obeys and is healed and walks out. Jesus also states that he is only doing this to show the disbelievers in verse 10 that he is in fact who he says he is. But that you may know that the Son of Man, that's Jesus, has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus has the authority to forgive our sins. So all those bad things you've done, all the sins that rack us with guilt and keep us from living God-glorifying lives, that keep us from fulfilling God's purpose for our lives, all those obstacles in our way that sin creates, if we believe in Him, Jesus wipes it all away. For the Son of Man, that's Jesus, has authority on earth to forgive sins. But wait, the best part is yet to come. Later in the chapter, Jesus is eating with Levi, a.k.a. Matthew, and some other tax collectors. Some Jewish leaders question him as to why he is eating with these people whose society hates and no one wants to associate with. Jesus responds in verse 17, Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. 
Jesus came to earth and died on the cross to save sinners. He did not come for the righteous, but for those who needed his righteousness. Because of this, no obstacle is too great to overcome. Because of what Jesus did for us on the cross and the sacrifices he made for us. He came to save sinners, not saints. Just like the crippled man needed help from his friends to get to Jesus, to overcome the massive obstacles in his way that day, so we too need help. And Jesus gives us the ultimate trump card. He gives us the ultimate helper. We see this in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 15 to 17. It will be up on the screen behind me. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So right before Jesus ascends into heaven, he gives the disciples and all others who believe in him the Holy Spirit to dwell within us always and forever. Because we know and believe in Jesus and want to live our lives that honor and glorify him, just like the four men helped the crippled man reach Jesus, so too do we need the Holy Spirit to help and guide us, to keep us on the right track, so we may overcome any obstacles in our way. To be reminded that no sin is too great to keep us from living a life connected to Jesus and his church. More than this, we need to come together and help and support each other, understanding each other's points of view, so that we, and that we all have different obstacles to overcome so that we can work collectively as God's church to know Jesus and make him known. And through the help of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of his Spirit, we can overcome every obstacle that stands between us and God. So whatever obstacles are in your way, I urge all of you and all of us collectively as the body of Christ and as this faith family, rely on the Holy Spirit. Ask him to help you get through those obstacles, and he will. Amen.